Welcome to World Shared Practices Forum. I'm Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Pediatric Critical Care here at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We're very pleased to have with us today Professor Catherine Maitland. Dr. Maitland is Professor of Tropical Pediatric Infectious Disease at the Imperial College in London. Most of her work over the last several decades has been in East Africa where she's studied malaria, uh, malnutrition, sepsis, and anemia. We're here today to discuss with Dr. Maitland her findings in the so-called FEAST trial, which was published in the New England Journal in June of 2011. But before we do that, uh, and unlike some of our World Practices Forum, we have questions that we would like to ask you so that we can understand resuscitation practices around the world. In your response, please first type the city and country where your hospital is located. The first question is, what type of fluid do you use to resuscitate your patients who present with shock in your institution? Crystalloid or colloid? And if crystalloid, what composition? And if colloid, what composition? Now the second question, and again, if you could be sure to include your city and country. The second question is, how much fluid do you administer both per bolus as well as the goal number of boluses to resuscitate your patients who present with shock in your institution. For example, 20 cc's per kilogram per bolus, up to how many boluses are administered before you will hold further fluid resuscitation and add in a vasoactive agent. Finally, the third question, over what time period do you aim to administer these fluid boluses? The first hour, the first four hours, the first 24 hours? Again, please remember to type the name of the city and country where your hospital is located. We're back now. Uh, Dr. Maitland, I wonder if we could begin by asking this. Could you take us through, you know, you've done several decades of research, and it, I certainly don't expect you to re review all of your research, mm. but were, what were some of the salient findings um, that prompted you along the way to form the hypothesis mm -hmm. that led you to the study that we'll be discussing today? Thank you. Um, after spending a, um, um, a decade uh, doing malaria research and, um, and knowing that I was about to come to Africa, I wanted to obviously bring something to Africa that was important for children with severe malaria. At the time when I was uh, about to come to Africa, I was aware that the mortality from severe malaria had really largely remained unchanged um, with between 15 and 20 percent of children dying. Um, Malaria was being largely described as either cerebral malaria or severe malaria and anemia. It had been recognised that children with malaria had acidosis, but really there hadn't been, although there'd been a, a few adjunctive therapies tried, there hadn't been any um, way in which it was being articulated as the critically ill child. Most children um, arrive as emergencies and, and therefore I thought, well, from what we've learned in paediatric critical care, um, maybe taking a structured approach to their management might improve outcome. In terms of a hypothesis behind that, we, were, um, we understood that a large number of children had uh, severe acidosis. And in critically sick child, um, the most likely cause of um, severe malaria, uh, severe acidosis, um, is, would be likely to be um, hypervolemia but we had no evidence to suggest that. Just stepping back a little bit from that, I mean, although malaria is a very common cause of admission to hospital, there are many other children coming to hospitals in, in Africa. In, in fact, about a third to a half in their final illness will access a, um, a health facility. Um, and many of the deaths that do occur in Africa will, or in those children will occur in the first 24 hours. So, this would not just this type of work would not just apply to children with severe malaria, but may apply to all other children. That if we actually look at a structured way of managing them um, at admission, um, then that might really substantially improve outcome. Shock we we found complicated about um, fifteen percent of these children, and at the point in time when I came to start to study this, most children were not receiving fluid resuscitation. And I think before I start to describe some of the uh, uh, first sort of um, studies that we did, I think, can I just do, in order to put this in context, I think the, the, the best way to do that is to take you to the bedside um, in Sorote, 
um, in eastern Uganda um, and to see the typical patient that comes into the hospital in Africa. Um, little Achen Loy um, uh, was in profound shock at admission. She was uh, semi-comatosed. She had a base excess of minus 28. Um, the doctors were in a dilemma how to best manage her. They knew she only had hours to live. Um, at the point in time, um, most ch the, of ch um, children like Achen Loy were not receiving boluses of fluid. Um, doctors were very cautious about doing this because they were concerned that they may cause the harm of giving fluid boluses and they really needed to understand whether children such as Achen Loy did have the physiological uh, signs um, of shock, not just externally but obviously cardiovascularly. So we went on to do a, a series of studies um, in uh, children with this, in, primarily with severe malaria, um, particularly focusing on this group who have severe acidosis, um, um, in order to, uh, for us to establish uh, whether their physiology uh, looked like septic shock. Uh, we did prospective studies um, uh, um, 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 putting CVPs into these children, many of whom we couldn't put CVPs into at admission because they were so profoundly shocked. Um, um, we did find that the CVPs were low on average between um, naught and 2 um, at admission and with boluses of either albumin or normal saline we found that the CVPs um, within an hour or so would come up to um, between 6 and 8 so into a normal range we, we couldn't we didn't want to give too much more fluid because we had we didn't have access to ventilation but we found that that, that stabilized the uh, at, at, at around there and we saw tachycardia coming down, heart rates coming down, and children beginning to wake up. Um, so for that, that really reassured us that, uh, the, that some of the pathophysiology of severe malaria, particularly those who are acidotic, looked very much like septic shock. Not only did we study uh, uh, children um, looking at uh, uh, CVPs and dose response, so those, those studies allowed us to find what was the optimum fluid that would correct shock, which we, we found again between 20 and 40 mils per kilo. But we were also uh, able with digital and mobile technology to actually look at myocardial function. And again, we found that there was a mild depression of my myocardial function, particularly in children who were acidotic. Uh, and again, we found this, the, 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 this, the myocardial function improved with boluses of, um, uh, of uh, colloid or crystalloid, and also their IVC collapsibility uh, reduced, again suggesting that the, you know, the, we'd, we'd got the pathophysiology correct. So these were the first studies that we did um, before we were able to do, go on to do further clinical trials. So we then, in these, these well, early clinical trials, we were very much interested in the type of fluid that would be the best for the children. We'd hypothesized that, particularly for children with severe malaria, they often come in with impaired consciousness, they have cerebral malaria, and we were anxious that if we gave a lot of crystalloid, we may cause children, with, particularly with cerebral malaria, to... Um, to give them um, the um, complications, to give them brain swelling. So we felt that it might be better to try and correct them with a colloid. And so um, we'd had a lot of experience with albumin in meningococcal disease. And so that was one of the first um, colloids that we started to study. So the first studies we were doing was looking at albumin versus saline. And then we went on to look at albumin versus gelafusin and, and some of the other um, colloids. And we saw throughout those studies that each single time we studied albumin against any other solution, and remember these are all, all fairly small studies but, um, um, and, and done, con conducted fairly carefully, that albumin always seemed to have a much, much better outcome, particularly in children who had impaired consciousness. So we were beginning to build up an evidence base to say, yes, the children have profound shock when they come in, we can safely correct it with fluid resuscitation. And the fluid that looks best in, all of, the, um, in our, all of our small studies appeared to be albumin. This culminated in a, a meta-analysis that we did looking at all of the fluid resuscitation trials that had been done in children um, in malaria, dengue, and also uh, sepsis. There weren't many, but these um, for the conditions of um, sepsis and also 
malaria that appeared that albumin, there was a weak evidence that albumin seemed to be the, the best resuscitation fluid in these. But all of these were very small trials um, and none of them had been controlled trials. And I think that that's an important point. Uh, Professor Maitland, um, that's a very helpful overview to understand your work to date. And it raises the question, I uh, wonder if I could turn to our colleagues around the world and could you tell us in what percentage of your patients in shock um, have you been placing a CVP monitor? Um, and if so, uh, what CVP do you target uh, in your fluid resuscitation? We're back now. Um, Professor Maitland, um, as I follow the evolution of, of the uh, small trials that you noted that you uh, were performing, it would seem that what was going to emerge would be a trial looking at colloid as the intervention. And yet, uh, that's not what evolved uh, in your work. And could you take us through that? Um, what changed? Why did uh, that not become the intervention? So we, although we had weak evidence that albumin was the, uh, a solution that had a much better outcome than any other um, solutions. It wasn't readily available in Africa. We were going to have to do a definitive trial to show that it was much better. Um, and um, so one, not just in efficacy, but it also the, the, uh, the, the cost benefit ratio. So it, for, for us to provide very, very convincing evidence for policymakers, um, we would have to do a definitive trial. And we looked around to say, well, what is the most widely available solution in Africa? And that was normal saline. And so really, those were the two solutions that we felt needed a head-to-head -head trial to be done um, to actually inform policymakers. And yet, uh, uh, Professor Maitland, what evolved was a controlled trial. <laughs> and um, could you take us through that? And I imagine uh, proposing a controlled trial in any environment, but uh, perhaps particularly in um, a resource limited environment, must have had many challenges, not just logistically, but more importantly, conceptually, and, and perhaps people saying ethically, could you do this? Mm -hmm. Could you take us through some of that? Thank you very much for raising that, because uh, we spent a long time considering the design of uh, a future trial, um, certainly particularly comparing albumin versus saline. But also we, ha we talked to the um, African investigators, the, the doctors at the, the sites, the consultants, and they weren't giving fluid resuscitation. Um, and they were, quite frankly, rather anxious about uh, giving fluid resuscitation because, um, as you will see in, in, in uh, um, the, the couple of slides that I'd like to show you, these are resource poor settings. Um, most children, most um, drugs will be given or fluids will be given in the emergency room and they have no access to ventilation. So there is, there is no safety backup. And so we, we had to think very carefully about whether we could safely do this in a larger trial and, um, and also reflect, reflect what was the standard of care. Um, at that point in time. And at that point in time, the standard of care for these children was no bolus. So we found it very difficult to actually get funding for the trial because people have had very, very strong opinions around what they felt should be the design of the trial. Obviously, paediatricians felt it may be completely unethical uh, to do this, whereas um, reflecting back from obviously what um, our, our African collaborators were saying was that, listen, you know, the rest of the world are giving up to 60 mils per kilo in 15 minutes. We are very concerned about the safety of that. Um, and so when you are looking at trying to provide some equipoise because, um, for getting doctors to enroll children into the trial, you have to listen to all views. And a controlled trial was the the best way to establish best practice going forward. And we felt that that was extremely important to do. And the final thing um, is that uh, there was a, a program that was imminent to be rolled out called um, Emergency Triage and Training, or ETAT, which had been endorsed by the WHO. And this was about to be rolled out in Africa, which would um, very much mimic um, PALS or APLS. Um, and would recommend fluid boluses, but actually the evidence supporting the um, benefit of fluid boluses was very poor. So we really did need to know um, before, we, before 
th um, this program was rolled out. Uh, Professor Maitland, um, the details of your uh, feast trial are well described in the New England Journal article, and uh, I don't want you to have to go through all of that again. But um, could you describe for us what you think are the salient features of your trial design, and perhaps especially with an eye towards what some of the questions have been since the trial was published? Thank you, Jeff. Um, I think the most important thing is that at the point of admission when doctors wanted to give float, we had a patient that was largely undifferentiated. So we tried to make sure that actually this trial was relevant to pediatric practice going forward, generalizability. And so we had very, very f few exclusion criteria. So, this, so the undifferentiated patient would include children with malaria, children with sepsis, they may be um, slightly anemic. The only groups that we did exclude were children with gastroenteritis, um, children with severe malnutrition, or surgical or tra trauma um, and burn. So they, they could easily be differentiated at the point of admission. But so the rest of the group, um, children who were in the trial were, were what would sort of largely be considered as having um, a, 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 a um, life-threatening febrile illness. Um, the interventions were given early, so we had um, three arms in the large control trial. We had um, an immediate bolus of albumin between 20 and 40 mils, or immediate bolus of saline. Um, and, the, uh, and, the, and this was compared to a control arm. Uh, the randomizations were done at the point of admission, and it was, um, it was done through a, a, a card system that couldn't be cheated. Um, so that it wasn't the doctors, and I think this is really important that the doctors didn't just allocate them. They had no idea when they opened that card uh, what intervention that child was going to get. Um, um, apart from the boluses um, within the two um, um, trial, uh, the two bolus arms, all of the other um, treatments for these patients were identical, and that's a, an important point. They were all managed in the same way. They were very, very carefully monitored. Um, doctors returned back to the bedside um, regularly, um, at regular intervals, always checking for signs of shock, always checking for signs of fluid overload, particularly those relating to the heart, the lungs, and the brain. So this is, this is we were obviously wanting to know whether this was beneficial, but obviously whether this was safe. Our primary endpoint was a, um, a very uh, important endpoint, which was 48-hour mortality, and the secondary endpoints included um, a mortality at 28 days, but also disability-free um, uh, survival. So um, it was conducted at six hospitals, so a multi-centre um, study in three different countries, um, and included a ability to get the, the sickest of children into the trial through an assent, an emergency consent procedure, which was approved by all ethics committees. Um, the trial was very, very well, um, very rigorously monitored by external monitors, um, and all personnel followed the trial protocol. Um, the trial sites were not allowed to enrol any more than four per day. Many more children would have been eligible, um, but so we were focusing on quality rather than quantity. Um, and the um, the trial sites, uh, the, invest the investigators in the trial had no idea of the accumulating evidence. There's only one committee that knew of the unblinded data, and this was um, a, a, an external committee called the Data Monitoring Committee. And they did five interim analyses. Um, and again, they would report back to us um, and either told us to continue or, um, um, or maybe uh, gave us no other recommendations as to the emerging data. So two cal calendar years into the trial, we'd enrolled over 3,000 patients. We were close to coming to an end, but not quite. We were asked to stop the trial. Um, and, the, um, and the committee said that because fluid boluses can be of no benefit, and this was a huge surprise for us. So, Kath, I have to ask you, when you got the call that day from the Data Monitoring Committee, mm. what did you think the outcome of the trial was? Well, I'd been doing research in this area for a decade. I'd stood by the bedside. I'd seen children get better. Um, we were aware that there weren't that many uh, reports of fluid overload in, in the children, um, and we were felt fairly uh, reassured by that. So 
when I when they, they I, I was told this when they said because fluid boluses can be an, of no benefit I, I was simply in disbelief I, I simply couldn't understand what they meant by that um, and it's quite interesting um, when when one looks to see what the, um, the other investigators in the trial also thought so I understand you have a clip of what the investigators in the field thought could we see that now before the presentation I asked nurses and doctors to try to predict what the result will be. Which treatment was better? So do you think the bolus worked or did it work? The bolus worked so, so much. Because they were dying patients and they were saved. We had our first patient who was brought in a moribund state and after the initial bolus, the girl got up and asked for a drink. So by that, it made us feel that fluids actually very important and it's good that we administer them uh, rapidly. Yeah, according to how I've been observing the, the children whom we've been treating, they've actually been coming up after giving the bolasses. Yeah, going by what I've read and what I've experienced in treating some of the children that give bolasses, I think some of them benefited. Based on observations, kids who received bolasses actually improved quickly. So I think uh, bolus has really helped in the immediate outcome. I wonder if I could ask our colleagues around the world, could you identify the city and country where you're located? And could you tell us, uh, did the results surprise you uh, that uh, fluid bolus has led to increased mortality? We're back now. Uh, Professor Maitland, as the, the results have, um, you've had time to think about the results, why, why do you speculate that fluid bolses are harmful? Well, first of all, I mean, the actual results of the trial showed that the 48-hour mortality um, in the bolus arms was 10%, uh, and um, in the control arm it was 7.3%. There was a 3.3% difference between the bolus versus the control arm. And we, you know, we went through every possible sort of subgroup that might have explained this, uh, um, uh, uh, this, this result. Was it a single center that had enrolled too many patients? But in fact, when we looked at every single subgroup, we couldn't find any, any pa patients in whom fluid boluses were of benefit. So there was no simple explanation. Um, it, the, the result was consistent across age group. It was consistent across all of the centers and, um, and all of the um, signs of shock, um, the, the severity of the acidosis, and in and very large subgroups of malaria and also sepsis. So it meant to us that actually this result was a real result because it was so duplicated in so many of the, these um, subgroups within the trial that this was probably not a chance finding. So we then had to go back and think, well, what really explained this? So we felt that the world really needed to know the result and urgently, and we've got this fast-tracked into the New England Journal, and from stopping the trial to getting it submitted into the New England Journal was less than three months, and between stopping the trial and publication was less than five months. We felt it, it was urgent that the, you know, the world needed to know this result, um, and it's uh, freely available, open access, so everybody can read that. And not just the feast trial uh, main paper, but there's a lot of supplementary uh, analyses that are also available on the New England Journal website. Professor Maitland, as you're well aware, um, many have searched for an answer by looking at the protocol and saying mm -hmm. it must have been something with the methodology. Mm -hmm. And you've just described a subgroup analysis, a detailed subgroup analysis, mm -hmm. which would seem to point against that. I wonder if we could get your concluding thoughts about those concerns. It was related to methodology. Mm -hmm. And then move on to your thoughts about what pathophysiologic explanation could explain why fluid bolus has led to an increased mm -hmm. uh, mortality rate at 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And that was, for me, one of the largest concerns that we'd actually d done a, a poor trial. There'd been some 
methodological blunder that a forensic analysis was going to come out to suggest that the trial sites hadn't adhered to the protocol. They'd maybe have enrolled the wrong patients. They may have been lost to follow-up explaining that we might have had an imbalance in the 48-hour outcome. But when we checked all of those things, actually the trial had been run to a very, very high quality. We had almost 100% uh, uh, um, uh, data on 48-hour mortality. All the trial sites had adhered to the protocol. Um, and the you know, recruitment, the eligibility, there was only two violations, which is almost unheard of. So it was a very well-run trial. So our forensic analysis initially think, you know, suggested there was no methodological blunder. So there had to be a physiological reason why children with boluses appeared to uh, um, not um, uh, have a worse outcome. Because it certainly wasn't that we, and if you actually look at the New England Journal, we didn't see an excess um, events of pulmonary edema, neurological um, swelling, or, or even allergic uh, reaction to albumin. So that really wasn't the, the initial explanation. So the first paper was out and we were still analysing the data uh, because we, we really wanted to understand a lot more about perhaps what were the terminal events, um, what the type of children who were in the trial, but also the terminal events that just preceded uh, that, um, and may give us an information on the modes of death. This paper has now been published um, and it's open access and it's in the BMC Medicine. It's called Exploring Mechanisms of Excess Mortality in Early Fluid Resuscitation. Um, and I think it gives you an idea of the uh, certainly the presenting syndromes that were largely representative of the typical child that would come into an African hospital. Many of the children were shocked and, and many actually had hypotension or a moderate hypotension. And if you look at that subgroup, that's where quite a lot of the mortality in the FEAST trial was contained. It was a very large group. Um, obviously, we also had quite large groups with neurological, pre predominantly neurological presentation and also respiratory. And if you saw the, the, the biggest sort of mortality, 28% in the bolus arms versus 21% in the control, was when all those three um, coincided with a single patient. Uh, children who only had uh, feast shock criteria um, and didn't have any of those major syndromes that we described actually had a very, very low mortality. There was only 1% overall, but again, that didn't show that fluid boluses were of any benefit. We also, within that paper, explored shock reversal. So we were, um, all children had shock at admission, and we found, rather like that the doctors saw at the bedside, at one hour shock reversal was superior in the bolus arms. Uh, and it's um, not just shock reversal, but um, we also found that the neurological scores were much, much better in children who'd received fluid boluses um, at one hour compared to those who didn't. However, shock reversal at one hour did not translate to a mortality benefit. And I think that's really important that correcting a physiological endpoint does not necessarily uh, translate to a mortality um, endpoint, which was quite surprising. Um, the paper also, ex as I said, explored the terminal modes of uh, um, death. And we described these in three relatively large groups. Those who died of cardiovascular collapse, in other words, that died in shock, um, those who died of a, a neurological event, which we considered that might include children who had brain swelling, and those who died of a pulmonary syndrome. They were hypoxic and had severe pulmonary component to their final mode of death. So again, that probably might include children who had pulmonary edema. And while there were some, a tiny sort of excess in mortality in the pulmonary groups in the bolus versus control, the large majority of children in the FEAST trial died in shock. But the, the difference between the children who'd received a bolus compared to children who'd not received a bolus was enormous. We saw a huge excess in mortality, very early mortality of children in the bolus arms who um, went on to de develop lethal shock. So it suggests that actually early shock reversal uh, does, uh, the two, those two th things being put together does not translate to a, a mortality benefit, but actually these children went back into lethal shock um, and that, was the, that accounted for the vast majority of excess mortality in the FEAST trial. Kath, um, 
that's a very um, thoughtful um, description and explanation of, um, of these findings and where you are. Um, but I wonder if I could ask you this. I suspect that many are wondering um, this uh, failure of the early resuscitation at one hour to be associated with an improvement in survival at 48 hours and this lapse back into um, shock. Was it the absence of positive pressure? Had those children been put on mechanical ventilation as the next step in resuscitation, would that have been the difference in improving survival uh, in these children who had fluid boluses? What are your thoughts on that? That's a very, very good question. I think um, at this point in time, I really have to be honest and say, I don't know. Um, but there, we are doing further work and further research looking at the mechanics and some of that may involve looking at providing some positive um, some peep to, to these children and seeing uh, um, whether that may make a difference but I think what one has to step back from the results of the trial and say we did this piece of research in a typical African hospital where those facilities are not available at the moment and I think that one has to to understand the context of the work and thinking about the generalizability to those type of hospitals. So in fact mechanical ventilation really wasn't an option? No it isn't and I think uh, and, and that's the reason why we did the trial um, in, the, in that, those settings um, for resource poor settings that have no access to ventilation. Professor Maitland I wonder if we could now um, you know we just have a few minutes mm. left in this wonderful talk um, what are your thoughts now? What, and I, I'm interested to know your, your, your personal thoughts, your practice. You've had a lot of time to research this. Mm. You've had a lot of time to think mm -hmm. about the results. Mm -hmm. And um, you've just adequately, eloquently described that further research needs to be mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. But as we await further research, what is your practice and what is your thoughts about fluid administration right now? Right. Um, so I think if you step back from it, and I think everybody should step back from the work and say, well, what was the evidence that fluid boluses were, a, were associated with benefit? And I think um, it's becoming very clear that that evidence is, is fairly weak. Um, the, the, the relevant research hasn't been done. Um, we've tried to do the relevant research in African hospitals, and that's resulted in excess mortality. So for hospitals like that, we would suggest that the, the best available evidence is, and, and not to stop fluids, but to give fluids slowly, and only that to replace what the child would normally drink, in other words, maintenance. But I think going forward, I think to give fluids slowly, but we don't know what the rates of those fluids will be, because there may be some children who might benefit from more fluids. But this should be done within a research context rather than making recommendations for well let's just try 10 mils per kilo. I think feast is the best available evidence at the moment and for resource poor settings I think for the children who were in the trial obviously severe febrile illness the standard of care should really be for those settings um, maintenance only. Kath Maitland uh, this has been a fascinating talk and we so appreciate your coming from mm. Nairobi Kenya mm -hmm. Uh, to do this for mm. our colleagues around the world because we're also intensely interested in your interpretation of the study. You gave Grand Rounds this morning and uh, at that Grand Rounds it was standing room only and there was an editor-in-chief of a very prominent uh, medical journal and he stood up at the end and he congratulated you and he made the point that in critical care medicine over the last 15 years so, many, so much of the conventional wisdom and indeed some of the early trials that we thought were promising interventions have since been refuted, and in particular, normalization of values. Uh, that normalization of values for mechanical ventilation, we know, has been harmful. Uh, it now appears that uh, normalization of glucose is harmful. Uh, now we're worried about sedation in the ICU. And he made the point that we should be open-minded enough to uh, look at your evidence and question fluid boluses, rapid fluid administration, and be willing to study it as you've suggested. So I wonder now if I could turn to our colleagues around the world, and again, if you could tell us the city and country that you're in. And the question is this, should we be at equipoise on this issue of fluid administration and fluid bolus and resuscitation? And in particular, would your center be willing to be part of a clinical trial that examined uh, an intervention that looked at 
fluid resuscitation versus uh, uh, perhaps maintenance fluids as Dr. Maitland did in her study. And we look forward to uh, your responses. Kath, um, regardless of what people feel about the study, uh, I think I probably speak for all of us when I say you have our admiration for all the work that you've been doing in East Africa um, over the last decade or so, and we look forward to um, your future studies. Thank you very much. Thank you.